Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Dean Roper, the Director of Insights, and looks like we have a pretty global audience attending. So, uh, I think you're in for a treat today. We have uh, Gregor Piachota, who is re a researcher at the University of Oxford in the UK. I'll, I'll expand on his experience a little later because that title does not do Greg Orge much uh, justice for all the experience he has, not just in this topic, but uh, throughout his many years in the industry. I want to say that I'm also joined here with my great colleague, Nicole Frankenhauser, who uh, organizes our webinars here at Juan Ifra as a part of the global advisory team, in addition to the many things she does there as well. So this webinar is based on uh, the report that we just published uh, of the same name of the webinar, Re Reality Check, Making Money with Facebook. And the impetus for the report started back in the spring uh, of last year when we, or, or this year rather, when we f created a focus expert group around the whole topic of platforms uh, and especially starting with Facebook since Facebook is naturally the largest platform out there in terms of reach. Now that expert group uh, is tackling a number of issues. It's an ongoing project. Uh, and, and of course, some of the main things that, that we are addressing are monetization, uh, trust, and some of the issues around tech taxation. But the report uh, is solely about monetization uh, and it's all about rethinking your relationship uh, with Facebook and, and other platforms as well. Uh, the report can be downloaded for members at this address uh, below. Um, and we have uh, a number of reports uh, that we've produced, not just in the last few months, but uh, throughout the years that the, the wanifer.org slash reports uh, address, you go there, you can find a lot of reports to download for our members. Our non-members who, who are attending, uh, if you would like to have uh, an executive summary of this report, please just uh, send me an email. I will go back real quick. There's my email address, uh, or you can find me very easily on our website, and I would be happy to send you the report. So uh, Greg Orge, who we like to affectionately call Greg, uh, today he will be talking about basically what is your platform strategy and looking at some of the basic approaches that some publishers around the world have adapted to, you know, to address this burning issue within the industry for sure. And as well, he'll talk a little bit how some, what are some of the decisions that they're taking uh, in the past, in the past months, in the past year. Now, a proper introduction for, introduction for Greg. Um, Greg's not just a researcher, he's absolutely uh, a, a former editor at uh, Gazeta Wyborska, which is owned by Agora in Poland. Uh, but right now, he's a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford. Oxford. And uh, when he was doing some of the research for us, he was an associate, uh, a research associate at Harvard Business School, where he was studying uh, and researching disruption, and not only disruption in, in uh, media, but other industries as well. So Greg, in many ways, is becoming a platform guru. And uh, that's why we called on Greg uh, to help us with the report. And I think it's, a, it's an excellent report. And, and now we're going to turn it over to Greg for the presentation. Give me one minute here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here is Greg Pichotta uh, from sunny Oxford in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, uh, today, uh, to be with you today. So, when a few months ago, uh, one Ifra asked me a question, how do publishers make money with uh, with Facebook? 
I soon realized it is a sort of a mission impossible because publishers in general do not make money with Facebook. Uh, we focus on Facebook just because it is uh, the biggest of social networks and so digital platforms out there, but obviously there are many more. Uh, Facebook is currently used by about 80% of all internet users worldwide, according to different studies. This is the study from the Reuters Institute uh, at the University of Oxford in uh, 36 biggest news markets. Basically, people, 80% uh, of internet users use one of Facebook uh, services like Facebook or Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or Instagram. What we are seeing and what we will be talking today is a digital disruption to the business model of news. Uh, traditionally, publishers were making most of the money with advertising. And what we are seeing is that in the digital, uh, you need to uh, aggregate a very big audience to be able to make money with ads. And there are two winners in this attention economy, the companies that aggregate the largest audiences, collect uh, the largest number of data about these audiences, and are able to sell targeted ads. And this is Facebook and Google. So the combined share of Google and Facebook in the US is estimated to about 70% right now. And it is also estimated that they basically grab most of the market growth. Very similar estimations are published about other markets in the Western world like in the United Kingdom or other European markets. Uh, representatives of Facebook and Google, they question these numbers, although they don't provide alternative numbers that would basically show that the situation is much different. Anyway, you know, most of publishers that I'm talking to tell me that they see that basically uh, these are the dominant players on the arts market. So, and what, what is going with the rest of the money? So if 70% is going just to these two, what is going with the rest? So basically in the digital, uh, in the digital world, there are many technology uh, suppliers and providers that capture a lot of value coming from advertiser to the publisher. According to a study by the European Magazine Media Association, basically uh, publisher gets about one third of the money that advertiser is spending today on digital ads. All the rest is going to some other, to some other uh, intermediaries. The result is that basically it's, uh, the advertising revenue is becoming much harder and much and harder uh, to get. So can publishers, at the same time, publishers get a, a very big presence on, on digital platforms like Facebook. For example, right now, when we have done a survey among OneIfra members, they told us that on average, a uh, percentage of share of Facebook referred traffic to their sites is about uh, 33%. It doesn't mean that they are able to monetize it very well, and it doesn't mean that uh, all the effort to publish uh, stories on Facebook platforms is basically very um, uh, is profitable because basically they say that Facebook all kind of payments from Facebook like um, uh, fees for, for the live video or advertising shares from instant articles and so on and so on is, is no more than uh, on, it's on average seven percent of their digital business uh, revenue. In fact, the med median is lower, it's about 3%. And a quarter of all publishers surveyed by me uh, told that uh, they, don't, they are not getting any money uh, directly from Facebook. When we think about, you know, maybe, maybe these publishers in general are not very good in monetizing Facebook. And there is a study in the United States, it's a survey of the 70 top publishers uh, and as top publishers, I mean the New York Times, the Washington Post, companies like ABC, CBS. So these publishers uh, are the biggest, you know, some of the biggest in the world, and they obviously operate on the richest digital advertising market. And what they can get from all the platforms really is about $1,300,000 per month. This is the average monthly platform revenue uh, last year. And most of the money was really coming not from Facebook, but rather from YouTube. 
So uh, if you think that, you know, maybe one day you will get as big as the New York Times and you can reach, I don't know, 120 million users worldwide and, you know, you, you find a way to monetize it uh, very well and to get the best access you can imagine with Facebook and Google and the other platforms. Yeah, this is what, what is really the end game. Yeah, this is, this is, this is what these publishers are. Uh, this is what these publishers are getting. And it leads to a question, okay, so maybe, you know, what would happen if Facebook would share all the money it earns? And what you see is that if you divide uh, total Facebook's advertising revenue last year into all page publishers, that is uh, 50 million right now, all over the world, you know, you cannot expect that this, uh, that any share, a revenue share, with Facebook will really become a sustainable source of funding for news operations worldwide. Obviously, there will be some big publishers that get that could get you know much better results than 500 bucks per month uh, per year. But basically, it is not going to be a, a it is not going to be a solution. That's that's why that's why when we think about uh, what publishers are doing about uh, when they engage with platforms, we need to think that this is uh, uh, that platforms are extremely disruptive to the business model, and it is not only an editorial decision, it is not only an audience development decision. I think it is one of the most important business decisions that publishers today uh, make. Anyway, when we survey publishers, what we hear is that publishers think about Facebook. May, mostly as a sort of a pipe, as a distribution channel. So distribute, distributing my content to audiences, this is what 70% of publishers told us is the main objective of engaging with Facebook, targeting uh, new audiences, building brand awareness. So acquiring customers on Facebook to gener generating any sales outside of the platform is uh, an objective only for 40% of publishers. So we treat Facebook as a not as a disruptor, but rather as a distribution channel. Then when you think about what publishers are doing, you know, when they are hedging their risk on, of engaging with one platform and they are engaging with plenty of platforms like uh, Alexa, Facebook, you know, Instagram, um, uh, Pinterest or Snapchat, whatever, whatever, whatever. What they are doing basically is they are further unbundling their products. So they allow uh, uh, their products to be divided into smaller chunks. It makes it much more difficult to uh, much more difficult to uh, to uh, monetize. And when you think about how platforms uh, change also the brand perception, one of the biggest problems on Facebook and other platforms is that basically you cannot uh, differentiate between the content produced by quality news producers and uh, individual users or, you know, like fake news sources. In this case, you have two most engaging stories on Facebook before the American uh, presidential elections. On the left, you see the story from the Washington Post written by an Applebaum, a very respected journalist. On the right, there is a story from a website called The Daily Presser, uh, written by somebody uh, calling himself the American Patriot. That was a complete, uh, it was a false news. The thing is that when you when when a when a when a when a user who is not a you know like a professional and frequent uh, uh, news consumer, basically it's very difficult to distinguish on the first at the first sight uh, which which one was uh, which one is not is is published by a respected publisher and perhaps it's not uh, fake news. So I think that publishers need to think about a strategic response to the uh, to the disruption to their business and to their brand uh, by digital platforms. And of course, there are many options outside of like a regular um, uh, business. So first, of, there are publishers who believe that we should lobby more uh, for uh, regulatory interventions and uh, publishers, especially in Europe, are uh, you know working hard in diff on different in different on, on, on national level and on a European Commission level uh, to, to 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 engage with regulators about how the platforms could be could be regulated. This is the the, the problem with this solution is that uh, basically 
uh, it is the consumers that are disrupting markets. Facebook is an enabler and Google is an enabler for certain behaviors of, of users. So it will not basically stop some tendencies of users that users like to access content through uh, social uh, through social networks, that they like to uh, access content through aggregators and that uh, uh, and that uh, they prefer, of course, to uh, en masse uh, to access content without payments. Then there are publishers who launch their own platforms. Uh, this is not a solution to everybody, but obviously you see uh, publishers like Naspers from South Africa, like Shipstead from Norway, or Axel Springer from Germany that launch their own uh, digital marketplaces or, um, or uh, data exchange uh, uh, alliance, uh, create data exchange alliances to compete with digital platforms in the advertising space by uh, basically collecting more information about users uh, uh, and, and be able to reach uh, higher, uh, uh, bigger audiences. Then th there are these uh, the national alliances being created all across Europe. Uh, that want to basically share technology, share data about customers, and this is this is this is like these are like solutions that you can do outside of your business. The question is, what can you do about uh, your particular business to respond to this disruption? And I think we should look at the root problem. This is like the main topic of the of the report is basically trying to have a look at the root problem, at the uh, disruption. At the, at the disruption wave that we at, the, at Harvard Business School call decoupling. Basically, uh, what platforms are doing is that they allow individual consumers to avoid certain activities that traditionally were linked with uh, like consuming, consumption of content. Uh, and they can allow them to basically uh, avoid them completely or uh, or basically uh, minimize their, uh, their value eroding uh, powers. So in traditionally, when a, when a user wanted to get news, he, he needed to think about choosing the brand, medium, uh, visiting a particular website of, a, of, of, of his favorite brand, or getting an app, and then uh, the person was browsing for content, and then the finding the content, uh, consuming it, and by the way, seeing the ads, and this was the way the publisher usually was monetizing uh, these uh, monetizing this engagement the thing is that what platforms are really doing the platforms allow consumers to avoid some value eroding activities uh, you know you don't need to lose your time effort money to think about the brand about choosing a website about browsing for content you just go to facebook you get all the news uh, aggregated from different sources, uh, personalized just for you, so you, you you save time browsing, and you just consume the content. And by the way, you will see less ads than on other sites. So by doing that, Facebook, of course, became such a powerful uh, media company, I believe. But at the same time, it uh, demolished the business model of uh, publishers. And if you think that the decoupling is the root cause for this disruption, what we could do is to think, what about charging other parties for content itself? So you cannot basically decouple content consumption from advertising consumption because content itself is somewhat paid. And I uh, was looking for different publishers to find how they try to monetize content itself. So when you look, for example, in the New York Times, you see that they started to charge consumers obviously with a paywall but then they started to charge to charge marketers for creation of content content that is uh, like branded content uh, that is uh, useful for readers and interesting for readers but at the same time it's fully paid by the publishers they also acquired some some external uh, uh, companies like Wirecata that is creating reviews about uh, electronics uh, and it's funded by the uh, share, but affiliation fees from the sellers of these electronics that is reviewed. So basically the content is funded by the, uh, by the shops that are selling these uh, electronics. Then they also started to ask for donations from their readers. So as a, as a reader, I can sponsor a subscription for a student because if I believe in the mission of the New York Times 
and the app values and i believe you know they should they should it, it should be it should be accessed by more people i can fund it and of course they also sell content uh, to other publishers like the toronto star uh, and when you look at their numbers for the last year you see that this is a lot of money they are making with these different forms of uh, with these different business models and different forms of, 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 of uh, funding content. You know, last time, the New, last year, the New York Times made around $206 million uh, with digital advertising. So digital only subscriptions is already a bigger source of revenue than, digital, than all digital ads. Then when you think about syndication, e-commerce events, it's uh, according to the uh, annual report, it's $77 million branded content this they started to uh, produce it just three years ago and in three years they have an estimated uh, revenue of 60 million dollars from this uh, from this business then uh, i estimated the uh, annual um, affiliate marketing revenue from wirecutter at about 10 million dollars i just took some numbers that they published about the uh, about the gross uh, value of products sold on the platform and calculated the average affiliated marketing share. And in the first month uh, when they were uh, selling these uh, donated subscriptions to students, they claimed that they sold uh, more than a million, uh, more than a million sub subscriptions, taking the cheapest rate for the student subscription you get uh, uh, a revenue of like five million just for a just for the first just for the first uh, campaign of selling these donated subscriptions. What you see is basically that a, most of these new business models provide more revenue than currently New York Times can get from all of the platforms like Facebook or Google. So I think that by going into uh, business model innovation, you basically can get better results. When we, when we asked one of our members about the business models that they have, most of them told us that they still focus on digital display advertising that we have shown is, uh, is, is dominated by, a, by the duopoly of two platforms and the rest of the money basically goes to different technology companies. So we pursue the business model that we are basically uh, losing uh, ground. And then you see that uh, plenty of publishers um, uh, started to sell branded content. It's, uh, they understand the business because they know how to create valuable quality content and they have uh, their sales teams to sell it to advertisers. Then uh, many publishers are already engaged with events. Interestingly, half of publishers only of, uh, that were surveyed uh, have started to sell digital subscriptions or uh, donations and not many publishers are engaged in e-commerce. What is interesting about these other business models is that when you change the business model, suddenly you stop being a direct competitor of Facebook. You become more like a business partner. This is because basically you don't compete for the same ads with Facebook. Uh, you treat Facebook as a sort of a fishing pond for your customers whom you will be uh, selling your digital subscription or inviting to your event or you will be using platforms to distribute uh, the branded content uh, that you that you uh, that you sell so uh, changing a business model changes also the relationship with platforms and I think this is absolutely it's absolutely crucial to change the relationship. For many years, we were discussing whether publishers, whether, whether platforms are friends or enemies of publishers, and this discussion didn't lead us to any, 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 any solution. Uh, I think that the changing of the business model can, and then we basically change the relationship. We rather hire platforms to do some work for us. Then I, I strongly believe that publishers need to have a platform strategy. And this platform strategy is based on several uh, absolutely top questions. What's the business model of a publisher? What do you seek on the platform? And what's the end game uh, result of the, of the engagement with, with, the, with the platform? Let me just show you 
uh, the result of my surveys. So this is like four generic uh, platform strategies that I'm seeing all over the world. So you see that there are publishers that whose business model is uh, basically not, they don't need to monetize their internet traffic. Uh, they, these are publishers that are funded by somebody else. For example, the BBC that is funded by license fees. Uh, Russia Today, RT, or Al Jazeera that are funded by their states. Um, uh, in non-profit organizations like Human Rights Watch, Greenpeace, Amnesty International that produce a lot of quality journalism. These organizations don't monetize the traffic. So when they go to platforms, they have different objectives. They want just to get as much audience as possible to have people consuming content on all channels. And therefore, their strategy will be very different from some other publishers. Uh, then uh, when you think about publish publishing houses that still make most of the money with digital advertising, they go to the platform to get the audience, but then the, the end game is they need to monetize the, the audience's attention. So it means that they uh, engage into sort of a competition strategy. They collaborate because they want to publish some content on the platform to get people back to their sites to, to be able to monetize them. Or they negotiate deals like with instant articles uh, to, um, uh, to, to get some share. Or they create brands on uh, Facebook and other platforms just to distribute uh, the content, brand, branded content or content with product placements uh, or content promoting the stuff that they are going to, to to, to, uh, to sell. Then you will have publishers that basically look for a different business model than digital advertising based. They are going to the platform not to get the biggest audience possible. They are going to the platform to find the right customers, the customers that they can monetize uh, when they create a direct relationship. So basically they use content as a content marketing tool. And that's why I call this strategy a content marketing strategy. And of course, there are publishers who don't know what to do, or they want to experiment with a business model that is not that is not proven, uh, and they engage uh, they engage with platforms to learn to learn about, for example, a different uh, target group like young people, and they experiment with different with different tools. And let me just show you quickly the examples. So obviously, when you when you think about RT, uh, that you, you know is. Uh, is, is promoting a certain, a certain view of the world uh, funded by the Russian government. Uh, they don't need to monetize this traffic. It doesn't matter how much money they make on the platforms. Their whole goal would be to optimize the content for, uh, for viral distribution on platforms and to distribute to as many platforms as possible. So when you look at you know, the best, the best uh, practices of companies like RT, BBC, uh, Al Jazeera, I'm not saying they're the same, but when you look at the best practices in the social media, they are perhaps very inspiring, but you need to, when, when, when you need to think about whether they are, whether they can be applied at your business, you need to think about what's, what's, what's your business model. Maybe it's different than theirs. Then when you think about BuzzFeed, that is a prime example of a competition strategy, uh, BuzzFeed is, what they, what they notice is that they need to create like different brands that will be uh, that that they can produce content that will be funded by advertisers or will uh, include a lot of uh, product placements or will promote the products that they can sell and then they use uh, platforms as a uh, as basically distribution channels for these content but they found out that news is not probably the best content to, to 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 be monetized this way and that's why they invest in brands like Tasty that is about that is about food. Then when you have the New York Times, uh, the New York Times needs to uh, go to platforms. It's, 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 it's absolutely smart to go to the platform to find uh, potential customers and to engage with the customers, with some of the customers that you, that, you, that you have. But the end game is to get the customer out of the platform to, to the New York Times, to create the relationship, to register the person, to register, to get his email and start to send uh, newsletters and so on and so on to basically create a relationship that then, that then can be monetized with uh, digital subscriptions. And then this is noise. This is the product of Axel Springer uh, in many countries uh, in Europe. This is basically an idea that, you know, they, they, they don't want to risk 
uh, a very aggressive social media strategy of their main quality brands. What they do, they created a new brand targeting young people and using social media in a more in in, in a way similar more similar to BuzzFeed rather than uh, the New York Times. So if you want to chase reach, what we are finding, and you will find some case studies in the report, you need to go beyond national borders. This is what you quickly realize, that you need to think about markets as language markets. So you produce a, a, a global content in English or global content in Spanish, and this is how you can really chase reach. And it also, it also means that probably you need to go beyond news because uh, news is not uh, traveling that well. Uh, it's, it will be much easier to have product placement and branded content in other category, content categories. And you need to optimize your content for viral distribution. It means that you need to be on several platforms. You need to, uh, because the viral content goes across the platforms. So you need to, uh, you, you need to create content that will, uh, that will travel, that will travel well. But if you agree, uh, that you are not a mass media anymore because the mass medium, uh, Facebook is mass medium, not you. Uh, Facebook has two billion users, and perhaps most of the producers have uh, much much smaller audiences. Perhaps you should think about chasing money, not rich. And in such a case, I think this is a very good example. These are real numbers from the last year's uh, uh, financial report of the New York Times. When you count all 120 million uh, users of the New York Times.com monetized with ads, any visitor is worth $1.70 per year. When you think about how they monetize their digital subscribers, and at the end of, in December last year, they had just 1.8 million subscribers. These subscribers were worth for them on average $125. And of course, they also found some whales, some very uh, some 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 subscribers that wanted to pay much much more for their subscription. For example, through the sponsorship of students, of one of the clients paid one million one million dollars uh, for this subscription. What you what what you also observe is that most of these new business models, other than uh, based on digital ads, they uh, they require that you collect data about individual. Uh, individual users and building this analytics capability now is absolutely absolutely a must for publishers that want to that want to innovate with their uh, with their business models and you need to do it for many reasons because perhaps these are the uh, this is the graph showing um, basically uh, the readers behavior uh, on uh, on two different websites uh, these websites look very much uh, the same for a, for a naked eye, but when you look at the data, you realize that one website is having much more loyal users than the others, because the number of page views in a month is much higher uh, in case of one user. Many more readers uh, are, make, are making uh, more page views in a month than in the case of the other user. So if they would be just considering uh, creating a, a, a paywall uh, a metered paywall uh, with a meter uh, set at 10 articles in a month, basically they will catch completely different uh, percentage of their visitors into this, into this, uh, into this paywall. And uh, regardless whether you believe that, you know, digital subscriptions are for you or not, I think you need to build a, a data analytics capability to, to be able to to conduct this kind of analysis, because maybe you will be able to to to, to uh, experiment with these business models in the future. The last thing is that we are uh, publishers are uh, in the relationship with platforms like Facebook. They basically are not really um, are not really uh, they are reacting more to what platforms are proposing rather than they are pushing platforms into certain into certain directions. So we need to be able to make better decisions because platforms come and they propose, you know, you should go to instant articles and we should have better ways to make these decisions. What I think after talking to many publishers, how they do it and um, checking, you know, how, what, what the literature says about it. I think that obviously everybody's uh, testing value versus viability. So benefits versus costs and risks. 
what what is what is what what I think publishers are missing often is the difference between business and customer values. So platforms are usually uh, talking about value for customers, and uh, publishers are usually talking about value for business. I think that both are important. And uh, we, when we make our decisions, we need to take into account that sometimes our solutions are bad for customers, and we need to and we need to handle that. At the same time, I think uh, the platforms are making a lot of decisions that are com being completely focused on individual consumers, uh, and they are not taking into account the business uh, considerations of uh, publishers. I think that we need to test any any proposal uh, whether it's aligned with our brand and our digital strategy and our business model i think that publishers very often are not calculating all the costs of preparing curating engaging people on social platforms when you engage people on 10 platforms or more it's be, it's becoming a huge part of your of your of the time and effort of your workforce and I think that when you when you think about calculating the return on investment, you need to calculate all the costs, including the costs of uh, preparing and curating and engaging people on social platforms. I think that the process of making decisions should be deliberate. Uh, you should discuss it with people and you should document it because then you can come go back to these uh, to these decisions when you when you get another proposal from this or another platform. Uh, these are some ideas that you will find in the report about how you can score different uh, these are the different criteria that you can take into account uh, obviously uh, when i'm talking with individual publishers they have much uh, simpler ways to make these decisions uh, and you know i think it's important that you work all the time this is the example from Bilton's paper in germany so they, they look at the brand expression whether the brand can say what it wants and whether it's uh, well presented on the on the um, on the on the platform uh, they look at whether it's uh, whether they can engage users in the way they wish whether they can acquire new users like new target groups uh, what, whether it is possible to monetize with the way the build tries to monetize the, their relationship with with consumers and whether they can uh, whether people can subscribe to their content and I think that you know it's it's great and and I know that build is uh, developing these decision making uh, process uh, over years I think what it what it doesn't really take into account is basically is basically the costs and I think this is uh, this is how they could uh, you know their model how they can could improve their uh, their model and that's it are there any questions? I will be happy to. I'll be happy to answer. Okay, Greg. Thanks so much for that. Uh, actually, uh, we do have uh, one or two questions, and just let me uh, remind the audience, which I didn't remind you in the first place, is you can ask questions uh, by typing in on the panel on the right. There's a question button, so you submit your questions there, and we'll try to get to those. First question we have is from Anu. And he asked, or she, how are smaller publishers monetizing Facebook's instant articles? Facebook is subsidizing bigger publishers who are using uh, instant articles. How can small, smaller publishers get a piece of the pie, especially if the population is not in English or any other common language? The, you know, these are... <laughs> They can get a piece of the pie. It means that they can get a, a you know a small small revenue from it. I don't believe it is a sustainable way to monetize their content with uh, advertising options in uh, in instant articles. Uh, what what I've seen what what local publishers were doing quite more successfully was uh, first. So some publishers are uh, basically using instant. They, they are um, uh, on their sites with a Facebook advertising network. So this is the this is, uh, the, but the, but the money is not only in distributing through instant articles, but using Facebook advertising network also on the website of a publisher. So basically, advertisers can use uh, advertisers of Facebook like big. 
users can use Facebook targeting options to get uh, to get to consumers also on web pages of a of a publisher. And if a publisher has a has a big enough traffic, uh, it can get some revenue. In a way, it would be a similar way to use uh, to use uh, Google advertising uh, products to monetize the traffic. You cannot expect it will be a life-changing experience, but you can get more money through, uh, through that. So it's not only in some articles, it's rather how to monetize with Facebook advertising network. I think that publishers, uh, I've seen publishers that are uh, pretty successful with working with Facebook, but monetizing in a different way. So they monetize through branded content. So they sell, uh, so basically they create content uh, like content marketing campaigns for their local clients, and then they distribute this content paid by advertisers, not only on their own uh, sites and apps, but also using Facebook. And because they have skills like how to make content more viral, how to distribute, it, how to track, how to engage the public, they can charge advertisers for this service. Yeah? So this is uh, this is this is this is basically getting better results than just you know, posting content and waiting for somebody to, uh, waiting for from from the display ads. Then I've seen uh, publishers experimenting with uh, uh, product placement. So they create like uh, uh, local local uh, shows, uh, local videos from, I don't know, opening of shops and, and this kind of, this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, products and then they basically charge local advertisers for these uh, for, 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 for these products. If you want to if you want to make money just with instant articles, I've seen examples of publishers that are doing it, but they are never local. In fact, they are they try to be global. These are these are people who uh, create websites for you know for uh, all Latin speaking people around the world. Yeah? I, 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 in the report, I described an example of a company, a small company from Poland uh, that is run by 20 young people. And basically they created one of the biggest sites in Mexico. And they just create content. It's somewhat news, news oriented, but in fact, it's, you know, it's like curiosities and scandals. And they create this content. It's optimized for Facebook distribution for a huge market of Mexico and other uh, Spanish speaking uh, countries. This is this is so, but this is not a strategy that a local publisher can can follow. I believe. Okay, we have another question from Philippe, and it is: Facebook is actually working on a paywall tool through instant articles. Meanwhile, sh we publishers should we block or avoid this channel and concentrate on other ones? Uh, in fact. Uh, I know that Facebook is working on it. We don't know all the details of this new proposal. We know just what is reported in the what is reported in the in the news, and we just have some you know preliminary details. What we know is that, as far as I understand, Facebook is working now on uh, how to make the acquisition of customers for publishers easier using instant. Articles, so it's not a paywall technology, and as far as I understand, uh, the idea is basically that you will, st it will be still a publisher who will register the uh, who re register the reader and will and will process the payment. So you you need to think about it not as a like a paid content solution from Facebook. It's more rather it's more rather some additional tools. To acquire customers through Facebook, uh, through Facebook product. You know, when we learn more details about how it works, we, we could talk about it. When you think about, you know, like the uh, uh, customer journey to become a, a subscriber, I think we need to we may think about all the platforms like Facebook and the others as uh, extenders of our free offer. Yeah. So we every every most of publishers have a sort of. A, freemium type of model in which they offer some free content to convert people into uh, into paid paid offer and when you engage with a publisher with, 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 a, with a platform like Facebook basically you need to think that you give away more 
free content than you do on your own site. So you need to you need to uh, you need to uh, value you know um, how much you should how much you should really give away on the on the, uh, on, the on the on the platform. You know some publishers that I was working with found that uh, that in general, in en masse, the, the, the visitors that they are getting, that they are referred from Facebook are less loyal than other visitors, like visitors coming, for example, directly to the website. At the same time, when you think about like fund, finding consumers that could become, uh, that could become uh, subscribers, Facebook can be a powerful platform, especially when you engage targeting tools in Facebook. When you create, for example, a very easy way is to uh, re first retargeting people. So somebody visited your site, was thinking about subscription, and then uh, because you are using uh, a pixel, for example, and you have an email of this person, you can try to retarget this person on Facebook and show the ad, uh, perhaps targeted ad to this person about content that the person might be interested in, with the offer that might be uh, interested, interesting for this person to, uh, to get them back to the site and to convert them. Then also when you are looking for uh, lookalike audiences, Facebook has powerful tools, it has a lot of data about people. It can create very, uh, very. It has a sophisticated technology to create uh, these lookalike uh, groups that you can also advertise to. So, for example, you have people who I don't know are interested in your uh, foreign news on your site, uh, and you can collect uh, information about these people through the pixel, or you can collect their emails through registration, whatever. Then you create. Uh, then you can create a, a group of people that is very similar to those who visit your your foreign news section and advertise uh, and advertise uh, your services to this new group of people. So Facebook is a powerful marketing tool uh, for for digital for digital subscriptions. And I understand that the changes that they are going to announce sooner or later will basically show more options uh, to streamline. Uh, this conversion. Okay, we have time for one more question, Greg. Uh, and this is from Ryan. Uh, how are the Facebook publisher tests with mid-roll video advertising going? Have you heard anything? Uh, yes, so what we know is that uh, basically uh, they are not going very well. What I'm hearing from publishers is first that the average time that people watch these uh, these videos is not uh, is not that long, and therefore not that many people basically watch the ads that are in mid row, and that the revenue is not very uh, is 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 in fact is in fact uh, is in fact very low. But you know this is just a start that they started today. Facebook is investing in, in quality content. Uh, in quality video content uh, to run more ads and they are paying publishers uh, to produce, they are paying some selected publishers to produce like uh, uh, more premium, uh, more premium content uh, and we will see how it goes. I think it's too early to, you know, to really judge it. The first information we are getting is that uh, perhaps people are not really wishing to watch very long videos on Facebook. This is the problem that the whole platform might face, but it's very early. Okay. All right, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, I found it very fascinating and interesting as always. Uh, just a reminder to all attendees, first of all, thank you very much for attending. And we will send a summary of, uh, of the webinar to all participants via email. And the webinar will also be uploaded to YouTube on, and also on our site. And on our site, you, we, you can find more of our uh, webinars from the past. So feel free to explore those. And until our next webinar, thank you so much for attending and have a nice day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.